All right, we're back with Love in the Town of Cholera. This is chapter three. Um, I'm gonna break the chapter up into about three parts, about 20 pages each. So this is the first part, starting on page 105. At the age of 28, Dr. Juvenal Labrino had been the most desirable of bachelors. He had returned from a long stay in Paris, where he had completed advanced studies in medicine and surgery, and from the time he set foot on solid ground, he gave overwhelming indications that he had not wasted a minute of his time. He returned more fastidious than when he left, more in control of his nature, and none of his contemporaries seemed as rigorous and as learned as he, as he in his science, and none could dance better to the music of the day or improvise as well on the piano. Seduced by his personal charms and by the certainty of his family fortune, the girls in his circle held secret lotteries to determine who would spend time with him, and he gambled too on being with them, but he managed to keep himself in a state of grace, intact and tempting, until he succumbed without resistance to the plebeian charms of Fermina Daza. He liked to say that his love was the result of a clinical error. He himself could not believe that it happened, least of all that this... that at that time in his life, when all reserves of passion were concentrated on the destiny of his city, which, he said with great frequency, and no second thoughts, had no equal in the world. In Paris, strolling arm in arm with a casual sweetheart through a late autumn, it seemed impossible to imagine a purer happiness than those golden afternoons with the woody order of chestnuts on the braziers, the languid accordions, the insatiable lovers kissing on the open terraces, and still, he had told himself with his hand on his heart that he was not prepared to exchange all that for a single instant of his Caribbean in April. He was still too young to know that the heart's memory eliminates the bad and magnifies the good, and that thanks to this artifice, we managed to endure the burden of the past. But when he stood at the railing of the ship and saw the white promontory of the colonial district again, the motionless buzzards on the roofs, the washing of the poor hung out to dry on the balconies. Only then did he understand to what extent he had been an easy victim to the charitable deceptions of nostalgia. The ship made its way across the bay through a floating blanket of drowned animals, and most of the passengers took refuge in their cabins to escape the stench. The young doctor walked out down the gangplank dressed in a perfect alpaca, wearing a vest and dust coat with the... Dressed in perfect alpaca, not a alpaca wearing a vest and dust coat with the beard of a young pasteur and his hair divided by a neat pale part and with enough self-control to hide the lump in his throat not caused by terror but by sadness. On the nearly deserted dock, guarded by barefoot soldiers without uniforms, his sisters and his mother were waiting for him, along with his closest friends, whom he found insipid and without expectations despite their sophisticated airs. They spoke about the crises of, the crisis of the Civil War as if it were remote and foreign, but they halt all had an evasive tremor in their voices and an uncertainty in their eyes that belied their words. His mother moved him most of all. She was still young, a woman who had made a mark on her on life with her elegance and social drive, but who was now slowly withering in the aroma of camphor that rose from her widow's crib. She must have seen herself in her son's confusion, and she asked in immediate self-defense why his skin was as pale as wax. It's life over there, mother, he said. You turn green in Paris. A short while later, suffocating with the heat as he sat next to her in the closed carriage, he could no longer endure the unmerciful reality that came pouring in through the window. The ocean looked like ashes, the old palaces of the Marquises were about to succumb to a proliferation of beggars, and it was impossible to discern the ardent scent of jasmine behind the vapors of death from the open sewers. Everything seemed smaller to him than when he left, poorer and sadder, and there were so many hungry rats on the rubbish heaps of, of the streets that the carriage horses stumbled in fright. On the long trip from the port to his house, located in the heart of the district of the Viserys, he found nothing that seemed worthy of his nostalgia. Defeated, he turned his head away so that his mother would not see, and he began to cry in silence. The former palace of the Marquis de Casa, Casal Duero, historic residents of the Urbino de la Cal family had not escaped to the surrounding wreckage. Dr. Juvenel Urbino discovered this with a broken heart when he entered the house through the gloomy portico and saw the dusty fountain in the interior garden and the wild brambles in flower beds where iguanas wandered, and he realized that many marble flagstones were missing and others were, were broken on the huge stairway with its copper railings that led up led to the principal rooms. 
His father, a physician who was more self-sacrificing than eminent, had died in the epidemic of Asian cholera that had devastated the population six years earlier, and with him had died the spirit of the house. Doña Blanca, his mother, smothered by mourning that was considered eternal, had substituted evening novenas for her dead husband's celebra celebrated lyrical soirees and chamber concerts. His two sisters, despite their natural inclinations and festive vocation, were fodder for the convent. Middle of page 107. Dr. Juvenal Urbino did not sleep at all on the night of his return. He was frightened by the darkness and the silence, and he said three rosaries to the Holy Spirit and all the prayers he could remember to ward off calamities of, and shipwrecks and all manner of night terrors while a curlew that had come in through a half-closed door sang every hour on the hour in his bedroom. He was tormented by the hallucinating screams of the mad women in the Divine Shepherdess Asylum next door, the harsh dripping from the water jar into the wash basin which resonated throughout the house, the long-legged steps of the curlew, curlew wandered in his bedroom, his congenital fear of the dark, and the invisible presence of his dead father in the vast sleeping mansion. When the curlew sang five o'clock, along with the local roosters, Dr. Juvenal Urbino commended himself body and soul to divine providence because he did not have the heart to live another day in his rubble-strewn homeland. But in time, the affection of his family, the Sundays in the country, and the covetous attentions of the unmarried women of his class mitigated the bitterness of his first impression. Little by little, he grew accustomed to the sultry heat of October, to the excessive orders, to the hasty judgments of his friends, to the we'll see tomorrow, doctor, don't worry, and at last he gave in to the spell of habit. It did not take him long to invent an easy justification for his surrender. This was his world, he said to himself, the sad, oppressive world that God had provided for him, and he was responsible to it. The first thing he did was to take possession of his father's office. He kept in place the hard, somber English furniture made of wood that sighed in the icy cold of dawn, but he consigned to the attic the tre treatises on physical science and romantic medicine, and filled the bookshelves behind their glass doors with the writings of the new French school. He took down the faded pictures, except for the one of the phys physician arguing the death from the nude body of a female patient and the Hippocratic Oath printed in Gothic letters, and he hung in their place next to his father's only diploma, the many diverse ones he himself had received with the highest honors from various schools in Europe. He tried to impose the latest ideas of Monsieur Misericordia Hospital, but this was not as easy as it seemed in his youth youthful enthusiasm, for the antiquated house of help was stubborn in its attachment to atavistic superstitions, such as standing beds in pots of water to prevent disease from climbing up to the legs, or requiring evening wear and chamois gloves in the operating room because it was taken for granted that elegance was an essential condition for asepsis. 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 Disease. They could not tolerate the young newcomers tasting a patient's urine to determine the presence of sugar, quoting Charcot and Trousseau, Trousseau as if they were his as if they were his roommates, issuing severe warnings in class against the mortal risks of vaccines while maintaining a suspicious faith in the recent invention of suppositories. He was in conflict with everything his renovating spirit, his maniacal sense of civic duty, his slow humor in a land of immortal pranksters, everything, in fact, that constituted his most estimable virtues, provoked the resentment of his older colleagues and the sly jokes of the younger ones. Bottom of 108. This is pretty dense. Lots of challenging words. His obsession with the dangerous lack of sanitation in the city. Oh, his obsession was the d dangerous lack of sanitation in the city. He appealed to the highest authorities to fill the Spanish sewers that were in that were an immense breeding ground for rats, and to build in their place a closed sewage system whose contents would not empty into the cove at the market, as he as had always been the case, but into some distant drainage area instead. The well-equipped colonial houses had latrines with septic tanks, but two-thirds of the population lived in shanties at the edge of the swamps and relieved themselves in the open air. 
the excrement dried in the sun, turned to dust, and was inhaled by everyone along with the joys of Christmas in the cool, gentle breezes of December. Dr. Juvenal Urbino attempted to force the city council to impose an obligatory training course so that the poor could learn how to build their own latrines. He fought in vain to stop them from tossing garbage in the mangrove th thickets that over the centuries had become swaths of putrefaction, and to have them collect it instead at least twice a week and incinerate it in some uninhabited area. He was aware of the mortal threat of the drinking water. The mere idea of building an aqueduct seemed fantastic, since those might have supported it had gone had underground cisterns at their disposal, where water rained down over the years was collected under a thick layer of scum. Among the most valued household articles of the time were carved wooden water collectors whose stone filters dripped day and night into large earthen water water jar earthen water jars. To prevent anyone from drinking from the aluminum cup used to dip out the water, its edges were as jagged as the crown of a mock king. The water was crystalline and cool in the dark clay, and it tasted of the forest, but Dr. Juvenal Urbino was not taken in by these appearances of purity, for he knew that despite all precautions, the bottom of each earthen jar was a sanctuary for water worms. He had spent the slow hours of his childhood watching them with an almost mystical astonishment, convinced along with so many other people at the time that water worms were animes, supernatural creatures who, from the sediments in still water, courted young maidens and could inflict furious vengeance, vengeance because of love. As a boy, he had seen the havoc they had wrecked in the house of Lazara Conde, a school teacher who dared to rebuff the animes, and he had seen the watery trail of glass in the street and the mountain of stones they had thrown at her windows for three days and three nights. And so it was long before he learned that water worms were in reality the larvae of mosquitoes, but once he learned it, he never forgot it, because from that moment on he realized that they and many other evil enemies could pass through our simple stone filters intact. For a long time, the water in the cisterns had been honored as the cause of the skirtle hernia that so many men in the city endured, not only without embarrassment, but with a certain patriotic insolence. When Juvenal Urbino was in elementary school, he could not avoid this, a spasm of horror at the sight of men with ruptures sitting in their doorways on on excuse me on hot afternoons, fanning their enormous testicle as if it were a child sleeping between their legs. It was said that the hernia whistled like a lugubrious bird on stormy nights and twisted in unbearable pain when a buzzard feather was burned nearby. But no one complained about those discomforts because a large, well-carried rupture was, more than anything else, a display of masculine honor. When Dr. Juvenal Urbino returned from Europe, he was already well aware of the scientific fallacy in these beliefs, but they were so rooted in local superstition that many people opposed the mineral enrichment of the water in the cisterns for fear of destroying its ability to cause an honorable rupture. Impure water was not all that alarmed at Dr. Juvenal Urbino. He was just as concerned with the lack of hygiene at the public market, a vast extension of cleared land along the Las Animas Bay, where the sailing ships from the Antilles would dock. An illustrious traveler of the period described the market as one of the most varied in the world. It was rich, in fact, and profuse and noisy, but also perhaps the most alarming of markets. Set on its own garbage heap, at the mercy of capricious tides, it was the spot where the bay belched filth from the sewers back onto land. The offal from the adjoining slaughterhouse was also thrown away there. Severed heads, rotting viscera, animal refuse that floated in sunshine and starshine in a swamp of blood. The buzzers fought for it with the rats and the dogs in a perpetual scramble among the deer and succulent capoons from Sodavento hanging from the eaves of the market stalls, and the spring vegetables from Arjona displayed on straw mats spread over the ground. Dr. Urbino wanted to make the place sanitary. He wanted a slaughterhouse built somewhere else and a covered market constructed with, st constructed with stained glass turrets like the one he had seen in the old Bocarias in Barcelona where the provisions looked so splendid and clean that it seemed a shame to eat them. But even the most complacent of his notable friends pitied his illusory passion. That is how they were. They spent their lives proclaiming their proud origins 
the historic merits of the city, the value of its relics, its heroism, its beauty, but they were blind to the decay of years. Dr. Juvenal Urbino, on the other hand, loved it enough to see it with the eyes of truth. How noble this city must be, he would say, for we have spent 400 years trying to finish it off, and we still have not succeeded. They almost had, however, the epidemic of cholera morbus, whose first victims were struck down in the standing water of the market, had, in 11 weeks, been responsible for the greatest death toll in our history. Until that time, the eminent dead were interred under the flagstones in the churches in the exclusive vicinity of archbishops and capitulars, while the less wealthy were buried in the patios of convents. The poor were sent to the colonial cemetery located on a windy hill that was separated from the city by a dry canal, canal, canal <laughs> whose mortar bridge bore the legend carved there by order of some clairvoyant mirror. Lasciate ogni speranza voi centrate. After the first two weeks of the cholera, ex cholera epidemic, the cemetery was overflowing, and there was no room left in the churches despite the fact that they had dispatched the decayed remains of many nameless civic heroes to the communal ossuary. The air in the cathedral grew thin with the vapors from badly sealed crypts, and its doors did not open again until three years later, at the time that Fermina Daza saw Florentino Ariza at close quarters as she left midnight mass. By the third week, the cloister of the convent of St. Clair was full all the way to its poplar lined walls, and it was necessary to use the community's orchard, which was twice as large as a cemetery. There, graves were dug deep enough to build to bury the dead on three levels, without delaying and without coffins, but this had to be stopped because the brimming ground turned into a sponge that oozed, sickened, infected blood, sickening infected blood at every step. Then arrangements were made to continue burying in the hand of God, a cattle ranch less than a league from the city, which was later consecrated as the Universal Cemetery. From the time the cholera, pro from the time the cholera proclamation, which was issued, the local garrison shot a cannon from the fortress every quarter hour, day and night, in accordance with the local superstition that gunpowder purified the atmosphere. The cholera was much more devastating to the black population, which was larger and poorer, but in reality it had no regard for color or background. It ended as suddenly as it had begun, and the extent of its ravages was never known. Not because this was impossible to establish, but because one of our most widespread virtues was a certain re reticence concerning personal misfortune. Top of middle, top of page 112. Dr. Marco Aurelio Urbino, the father of Juvenal, was a civic hero during that dreadful time, as well as its most distinguished victim. By official decree, he personally designed and directed public health measures, but on his own initiative, he intervened to such an extent in every social question that during the most critical moments of the plague, no higher authority seemed to exist. Years later, reviewing the chronicle of those days, Dr. Juvenal Arbino confirmed that his father's methodology had been more charitable than scientific and in many ways contrary to reason, so that in large measure it had fostered the voraciousness of the plague. He confirmed this with the compassion of sons whom life has turned little by little into the fathers of their fathers, and for the first time he regretted not having stood with his father in the solitude of his errors. But he did not dispute his merits, his diligence, and his self-sacrifice, and above all his personal courage deserved the many hour honors rendered him when the city recovered from the disaster. And it was with justice that his name was found among those of so many other hero heroes of less honorable war wars. He did not live to see his own glory. When he recognized in himself the irreversible symptoms that he had, been, that he had seen and pitied in others, he did not even attempt a useless struggle, but withdrew from the world so as not to infect anyone else. Locked in a utility room at Misericordia, hospital, deaf to the calls of his colleagues and the pleas of his family, removed from the horror of the plague victims dying on the floor in the packed corridor corridors, he wrote a letter of feverish, feverish love to his wife and children, a letter of gratitude for his existence in which he revealed how much and with how much fervor he had loved life. It was a farewell of 20 heart-rending 
monitoring pages in which the progress of the disease could be observed in the deteriorating script. And it was not necessary to know the writer to realize that he had signed his name with his last breath. In accordance with his instructions, his ashen body was mingled with others in the communal cemetery and was not seen by anyone who loved him. Three days later, in Paris, Dr. Juvenal Urbino received a telegram during supper with his friends, and he toasted the memory of his father with champagne. He said, he was a good man. Later, he would reproach himself for his lack of maturity. He had avoided reality in order not to cry. But three weeks later, he received a copy of the posthumous letter, and then he surrendered to the truth. All at once, the image of the man he had known before he knew any other was revealed to him in all his profundity. The man who had raised him and taught him and slept and fornicated with his mother for 32 years and yet who, before that letter, had never revealed himself body and soul because of timidity, pure and simple. Until then, Dr. Juvenal Urbino and his family had conceived of death as a misfortune that befell others, other people's fathers and mothers, other people's brothers and sisters and husbands and wives, but not theirs. They were people whose lives were slow who did not see themselves growing old or falling sick or dying, but who disappeared little by little in their own time, turning into memories, mists from other days, until they were absorbed into oblivion. His father's posthumous letter, more than the telegram with the bad news, hurled him headlong against the certainty of death. And yet one of his oldest memories, when he was nine years old, perhaps, perhaps when he was 11, was in a way an early sign of death in the person of his father. One rainy afternoon, the two of them were in the office his father kept in the house. He was drawing larks and sunflowers with colored chalk on the tiled floor, and his father was reading by the light shining through the window, his vest unbuttoned his el and elastic armbands on his shirt sleeves. Suddenly, he stopped reading to scratch his back with a long-handled back scratcher that had a little silver hand on the end. Since he could not reach the spot that itched, he asked for his son to scratch him with his nails, and the boy did so. He had, and as the boy did so, he had the strange sensation of not feeling his own body. And at last, his father thanked him, or looked him, looked at him over his shoulder with a sad smile. If I died now, he said, you would hardly remember me when you are my age. He said it for no apparent reason, and the angel of death hovered for a moment in the cool shadows of the office and flew out again through the window, leaving a trail of feathers fluttering in his wake, but the boy did not see them. More than twenty years had gone by since then, and Dr. Juvenal Urbino would very soon be as old as his father was that afternoon. He knew he was identical to him, and to that awareness had now been added to the awfulness, awful consciousness that he was also as mortal. Cholera became an obsession for him. He did not know much more about it than he had learned in a routine manner in some marginal course when he had found it difficult to believe that only 30 years before it had re been responsible for more than 140,000 deaths in Paris, or in France, including Paris. But after the death of his father, he learned all there was to know about the different forms of cholera, almost as a penance to appease his memory, and he studied with the most outstanding epidemiologist of his time, and the creator of Cordon Sanitaires, um, Professor Adrien Prost, father of the great novelist, so that when he returned to his country and smelled the stench of the market while he was still out at sea and saw the rats in the sewers and the children rolling naked in the puddles on the streets, he not only understood how the tragedy had occurred, but was certain that it would be repeated at any moment. The moment was not long in coming. In less than a year, his students at Ms. Ericordia Hospital asked him for his help in treating a charity patient with a strange blue coloration all over his body. Dr. Juvenal Urbino had only to see him from the doorway to recognize the enemy, but they were in luck. The patient had arrived three days earlier on a schooner from Coracho and had come to the hospital clinic by himself, and it did not seem probable that he had infected anyone else. In any event, Dr. Juvenal Urbino alerted his colleagues and the authorities warned the neighboring ports so they could locate and quarantine the contaminated schooner, and he had to restrain the military commander of the city who wanted to declare martial law and initiate the therapeutic strategy of firing the cannon every quarter hour. Save that powder for when the liberals come, he said with good humor. We are no longer in the Middle Ages. The patient died in four days, choked by a grainy white vomit, but in the following weeks no other case was discovered despite constant vigilance. 
A short while later, the Commercial Daily published the news that two children had died of cholera in different locations in the city. It was learned that one of them had had common dysentery, but the other girl, a girl of five, appeared to have been, in fact, a victim of cholera. Her parents and three brothers were separated and placed under individual quarantine, and the entire neighborhood was subjected to strict med medical supervision. One of the children contracted cholera, but, soon, but recovered very soon, and the entire family returned home when the danger was over. Eleven more cases were reported in the next three months, and in the fifth, there was an alarming outbreak. But by the end of the year, it was believed that the danger of an epidemic had been averted. No one doubted that the sanitary rigor of Dr. Juvenal Urbino, more than the efficacy of his pronouncements, had, been, had made the miracle possible. From that time on, and well into the century, cholera was endemic, not only in this city, but along most of the Caribbean coast and the valley of Magdalena, of the Magdalena, but it never again flared into an epidemic. The crisis meant that Dr. Juvenal Urbino's warnings were heard with greater seriousness by public officials. They established an obligatory chair of cholera and yellow fever in the medical school and realized the urgency of closing up the sewers and building a market far from the garbage dump. By that time, however, Dr. Urbino was not concerned with proclaiming victory, nor was he moved to preserve in his social mission. For at that moment, one of his wings was broken. He was distracted and in disarray and ready to forget everything else in life because he had been struck by the lightning of his love for Fermina Dessa. It was, in fact, the result of a clinical error. A physician who was a friend of his thought he detected the warning symptoms of cholera in an 18-year-old patient, and he asked Dr. Juvenal Urbino to see her. He called that very afternoon, alarmed at the possibility the plague had entered the sanctuary of the old city, for all the cases until that time had occurred in the poorer neighborhoods and almost all of those among the Black population. He encountered other, less unpleasant surprises. From the outside, the house, shaded by the almond trees in the Park of the Evangels, appeared to be in ruins, as did the others in the colonial district, but inside there was a harmony of beauty and an astonishing light that seemed to come from another age. The entrance opened directly into a square civilian patio that was white with a recent coat of lime and had flowering orange trees and the same tiles on the floor as on the walls. There was an invisible sound of running water and pots with carnations and on the cornices and cages of strange birds in the arcades. The strangest of all were the three were three crows in a very large cage who filled the patio with an ambiguous perfume every time they flapped, flapped their wings. Several dogs chained elsewhere in the house began to bark, maddened by the scent of a stranger, but a woman's shout stopped them dead, and numerous caps, cats leapt all around the patio and hid among the flowers, frightened by the authority in the voice. Then there was such a diaphanous silence that despite the disorder of the birds and the syllables of water on stone, no one could, or one could hear the desolate breath of the sea. Shaken by the conviction that God was present, Dr. Juvenal Urbino thought that such a house was immune to the plague. He followed Gala Placidia along the arcaded corridor, passed the window, passed by the window of the sewing room where Florentina Ariza had seen Fermina Daza for the first time when the patio was still a shambles. Climbed the new marble stairs to the second floor and waited to be announced before going into the patient's room. But Gala Placidia came out again with a message. The senorita says you cannot come in now because her papa is not at home. And so he returned at five in the afternoon, in accordance with the maid's instructions, and Lorenzo Daza opened himself opened the street door and led him to his daughter's bedroom. There he remained sitting in a dark corner with his arms folded and making futile efforts to control his ragged breathing during the examination. It was not easy to know who was more constrained the doctor with his chaste touch, or the patient in the silk chemise with her virgin's modesty. But neither one looked each other looked the other in the eye. Instead, he asked questions in an impersonal voice, and she responded in a tremulous voice, both of them very conscious of the man sitting in the shadows. At last, Dr. Juvenal Urbino asked the patient to sit up, and with exquisite care, he opened her nightdress down to the waist her pure high breast with the childish nipples shone for an instant in the darkness of the bedroom, like a flash of gunpowder, before she hurried to cover them with crossed arms. Imperturbable. Imperturbable. 
The physician opened her arms without looking at her and examined her by direct auscultation, his ear against her skin, first the chest and then the back. Top, middle of 117. Dr. Huvenal Urbino used to say that he experienced no emotion when he met the woman with whom he would live until the day of his death. He remembered the sky blue chemise edged in lace, the feverish eyes, the long hair hanging loose over the shoulders, but he was so concerned with the outbreak of cholera in the colonial district that he took no notice of her flowering adolescence. He had eyes only for the slightest hint that she might be a victim of the plague. She was more explicit. The young doctor she had heard so much about in connection with the cholera uh, epidemic seemed a pedant. pedant incapable of loving anyone but himself. The diagnosis was an intestinal infection of alimentary origin, which was cured by three days of treatment at home. Relieved by this proof that his daughter had not contracted cholera, Lorenzo Daza accompanied Ju who, Dr. Juvenal Urbino to the door of his carriage, paid him a gold peso for the visit, a fee that seemed excessive even for a physician to the rich, and he said goodbye with immoderate expressions of gratitude. He was so overwhelmed by the splendor of the doctor's family names, and he did not, and he not only did not hide it, but would have done anything to see him again under less formal circumstances. The case should have been considered closed, but on Tuesday of the following week, without being called and with no prior announcement, Dr. Juvenal Urbino returned to the house at the inconvenient hour of three in the afternoon. Romina Daza was in the sewing room having a lesson in oil painting with two of her friends when he appeared at the window in his spotless white frock coat and his white top hat and signaled her to come over to him. She put her palette down on a chair and tiptoed to the window, her bubble skirt raised to keep it from dragging on the floor. She wore a diadem with a jewel that hung on her forehead and the luminous stone was the same aloof color as her eyes and everything in her and everything in her breathed an aura of coolness. The doctor was struck by the fact that she was dressed for painting at home as if she were going to a party. He took her pulse through the open window. He had her stick out her, her tongue. He examined her throat with an aluminum tongue depressor. He looked inside her lower eyelids and each time he nodded in approval. He was less inhibited than on the previous visit, but she was more so because she could not understand the reason for his unexpected examination if he himself had said that he would not come back unless they called him because of some change. And even more important, she did not ever want to see him again. When he finished his examination, the doctor put the tongue depressor, depressor back into his bag, crowded with instruments and bottles of medicine, and closed it with a resounding snap. You are like a new sprung rose, he said. Thank you. Thank God, he said. And he misquoted St. Thomas. Remember that everything that is good, whatever its origin, comes from the Holy Spirit. Do you like music? What is the point of that question? She asked in turn. Music is important for one's health, he said. He really thought it was, and she was going to know very soon, and for the rest of her life, that the topic of music was almost a magic formula that he used to propose friendship. But at that moment, she interpreted it as a joke. Besides, her two friends who had been, who had pretended to paint while she and Dr. Juvenal Urbino were talking at the window tittered and hid their faces behind their palettes, and this made Fermina Daza lose her self-control. Blind with fury, she slammed the window shut. The doctor stared at the sheer lace curtains in bewilderment. He tried to find the street door but lost his way, and in his confusion, he knocked into the cage with the perfumed crows. They broke into sordid shrieking, flapped their wings in fright, and saturated the doctor's clothing with a feminine fragrance. The thundering voice of Lorenzo Daza rooted him to the spot. Doctor, wait for me there. He had seen everything from the upper floor and swollen and livid. He came down the stairs, buttoning his shirt. His side whiskers still in an uproar after the restless siesta. The doctor tried to overcome his embarrassment. I told your daughter that she is like a rose. True enough, said Lorenzo Daza, but one with too many thorns. He walked past Dr. Urbino without greeting him. He pushed open the sewing room window and shouted a rough command to his daughter. Come here and beg the doctor's pardon. The, doc the doctor tried to intervene and stop him, but Lorenzo Daza paid no attention to him. He insisted, hurry up. 
She looked at her friends with a secret plea for understanding, and she said to her father that she had nothing to beg pardon for. <laughs> You good, Cody? You feel Cody? I can see you. <laughs> uh, she looked at her friends with a secret plea for understanding, and she said to her father that she had nothing to beg pardon for. She had only closed the windows to keep the sun out. Dr. Urbino, with good humor, tried to confirm her words, but Lorenzo Daza insisted that he be obeyed. Then Fermina Daza, pale with rage, turned toward the window and extending her right foot as she raised her skirt with her fingertips, she made a theatrical curtsy to the doctor. I give you my most heartful apology, sir, she said. Dr. Juvenal, Juvenal Urbino imitated her with good humor, making a cavalier's flourish with his top hat, but he did not win the compassionate smile he had hoped for. Then Lorenzo Daza invited him to have a cup of coffee in his office to set things right, and he accepted with pleasure so that there would not be no doubt whatsoever that he did not harbor a shred of resentment in his heart. Um, toward the bottom of page 119. The truth was that Dr. Juvenal Urbino did not drink coffee, except for a cup first thing in the morning. He did not drink alcohol either, except for a glass of wine with meals on solemn occasions. But he not only drank down the the coffee that Lorenzo Daza offered him, he also accepted a glass of anisette. Then he accepted another coffee with another anisette, and then another and another, even though he still had to make a few more calls. At first, he listened with attention to the excuses that Lorenzo Daza continued to offer in the name of his daughter, whom he defined as an intelligent and serious girl, worthy of a prince, whether he came from here or anywhere else, whose only defe defect, so he said, was her mulish character, mulish character. But after the second innocent, the doctor thought he heard Fermina Dasa's voice at the other end of the patio, and his imagination went after her, followed her through the night that he that had just descended in the house as she lit the lights in the corridor, fumigated the be bedrooms with the insecticide bomb, uncovered the pot of soup on the stove which she was going to share that night with her father, the two of them alone at the table, she not raising her eyes, not tasting the soup, not breaking the rancorous spell until he was forced to give in and ask her to give, to forgive his severity that afternoon. Dr. Urbino knew enough about women to realize that Fermina Dasa would not pass by the office until he left. But he stayed nevertheless because he felt that wounded pride would give him no peace after the humiliations of the afternoon. Lorenzo Dasa, who by now was almost drunk, did not seem to notice his lack of attention, for he was satisfied with his own indomitable, eloqu indomitable eloquence. He talked at full gallop, chewing the flower of his unlit cigar, coughing in shouts, trying to clear his throat, attempting with great difficulty to find a comfortable position in the swivel chair, whose springs wailed like an animal in heat. He had drunk three glasses of anisette, to each one drunk by his guest, and he paused only when he realized that they could no longer see each other, and he stood up to the light to light the lamp. Dr. Juvenal Urbino looked at him in the new light. He saw that one eye was twisted like a fish, and that his words did not correspond to the movement of, of his lips, and he thought these were hallucinations brought on by his abuse of alcohol. Then he stood up with the fascinating sensation that he was inside a body that belonged to not to him, but to someone who was still in the chair where he had been sitting, and he had to make a great effort not to lose his mind. It was after seven o'clock when he left the pet office, preceded by Lorenzo Daza. There was a full moon. The patio idealized by Anisette floated at the bottom of an aquarium, and the cages covered with cloths looked like ghosts sleeping under the hot scent of new orange blossoms. The sewing room window was open, there was a lighted lamp on the work table, and the unfinished paintings were on their easels, as if they were on exhibit. Where art thou that thou art not here? Dr. Urbino uh, said Dr. Urbino as he passed by. But Fermina Daza did not hear him. She could not hear him, because she was crying with rage in her bedroom, lying face down on the bed and waiting for her father so that she could make him pay for the afternoon's humiliation. The doctor did not renounce his hope for saying goodbye to her, but Lorenzo Daza did not suggest it. 
He yearned for the innocence of her pulse, her cat's tongue, her tender tonsils, but he was disheartened by the idea that she never wanted to see him again and would never permit him to try to see her. When Lorenza Daza walked into the entryway, the crows awake under their sheets emitted a funeral shriek, funereal shriek. They will peck out your eyes, the doctor said aloud, thinking of her. And Lorenza Daza turned around to ask him what he had said. It was not me, he said. It was the anisette. Lorenza Daza accompanied him to his carriage, trying to force him to accept a gold peso for the second visit, but he would not take it. He gave the correct instructions to the driver for taking him to the houses of the two patients he still had to see, and he climbed into the carriage without help. But he began to feel sick as they bounced along the cobbled streets, so he ordered the driver to take a different route. He looked at himself for a moment in the carriage mirror and saw that his image, too, was still thinking about Fermina Zaza. He shrugged his shoulders, then he belched, lowered his head to his chest, and fell asleep. In his dream, he began to hear funeral bells. First he heard those of the cathedral, and then he heard those of all the other churches, one after another, even the cracked pots of St. Julian, the hospital litter. Shit, he murmured in his sleep, the dead have died. <laughs>